I should say that one of the questions I always get is, my gosh, there are all these biologics coming up for psoriasis. Uh, when's this all going to end? Well, this lecture is really the end of biologics for psoriasis. I can tell you what we're going to cover today is um, about it because you have mirakizumab, which is another anti-IL-23, and you have bimikizumab, which is another anti-IL-17 variety. And so you look at clinicaltrials.gov, that's it for biologics for psoriasis in any uh, real sense going forward. So if you think about what's going on in psoriasis therapy, it's going to go on to oral medication over time. But when you think about all the things we've shown, this is pretty much the standard of art, uh, state of the art of where we're going with psoriasis therapy and biologics. Now, when I was given 25 minutes to talk about anti-IL-23s, I said, how are we going to really do this? How are we going to go through it and go through all the potential issues of the drugs that are there and what are the benefits and what are the risks? And I said, I'm going to take a different tact. What I'm going to try to do is to demonstrate to you what makes anti-IL-23 therapy special, what makes it different from the other things we've had over time. Um, and the main comparison I'm going to use is to anti-IL-17s, because if you really look at the very, very high efficacy drugs, that's, those are the two categories that really come into play. And so I'm going to try to think about this as what's distinct and what's new and what's different, and hopefully that'll be uh, entertaining for you as we finish up what I know has been a very long but very educational meeting for everyone. So I'm going to start with a pathogenic uh, model of psoriasis. And this is the one we're all familiar with at this point. Uh, you have to, some kind of stimulus causing activation of dendritic cells, which puts out interleukin-23. That interleukin-23 then activates Th17 cells. You get IL-17 pr uh, produced, and a lot, as well as IL-22. And you get keratinocyte changes that end up in what you see in psoriasis. I want to point out a couple things. First of all, this model only is involving the pro-inflammatory pathways in psoriasis. It doesn't deal with regulation of psoriasis, and that's probably just as important, and we'll get to that in a second. And secondly, this is unilateral. Once you get to the end of the keratinocyte changes, that model we talk about that is simplified doesn't talk about all the other pathways that are going on. So the model falls short in that it would predict that medications that work along this pathway should all behave the same, and they don't. It doesn't include regulatory mechanisms and only posits the pro-inflammatory side of the pathogenesis of psoriasis. That's a very big simplification and actually misleads us into how we think about it. We need to look at more complex models to understand. So here's something that I expect everyone to have memorized by the time they walk out of here today. This is the more complex model. And what you see is a couple things. First of all, there is a post-keratinocyte inflammatory pathway that has a major impact on what's going on in psoriasis. Secondly, there are regulatory cells all over the place that downregulate psoriasis. Additionally, there are some things that are very important, really proximal, that are new, that I think are really, really fascinating, that can Im impact psoriasis as well. I'm talking about anti-IL-23, so I want to just point out before we go further a couple things that are unique about anti-IL-23 uh, medications and IL-23 in this pathway. First of all, we always think about IL-23 causing incitement of IL-17 production through Th17 cells. What we don't talk about is the primary regulatory function of interleukin-23 is when it's not there, Th17 cells undergo apoptosis. So not only are they not producing, they're not even there. And that probably has a major impact on the pharmacodynamics of, of anti-IL-23 therapy. Additionally, uh, with IL-17s in particular, these two molecules are representative of a thing called cantholocytins. Many years when I started doing research in psoriasis, and I was, still ran a lab and was a basic scientist, we were trying to find the antigen for the T cell activation for psoriasis. 20 years later, we're getting them. They're cantholocytins. They're these molecules proximal that are produced by many cells in the skin that might induce the T cell response in psoriasis. Interestingly, the production of those molecules is under direct influence of interleukin-17. 
In fact, anti-TNF therapy might cause them to go up, but anti-IL-17 therapy goes down. So if you wonder why anti-IL-17s might persist in effect, it might be because they're blocking the very initial steps of the psoriatic cascade. So here's it looking another way. It's this IL-17 that can be released by keratinocytes as the danger signal that induces um, the canthalocytins and the introduction of this whole TH17, IL-23 TH17 pathway. So again, putting that up front, again, I expect this is a simpler model, so if you really don't pass the test on the former model, you can take it on this one. So what are the clinical characteristics um, of the complex model? In an environment where we have more effect, uh, effective therapies, and I th I'm going to make the argument, I think we've seen it already today, that with the advent of anti-IL-17s and the new anti-P19, anti-IL-23s, um, we actually have more effective therapies. We have to f rely on this model, the more uh, extensive model, to be able to differentiate these molecules that bind at a high level. And these, do, these differences do impact management decisions. So again, we've seen the ixekizumab data already today. It was presented very nicely, but very, very high, likely, uh, high levels of response. This is the second kinumab long-term uh, data out to five years. And I'm not going to go into the different methods of imputation, but in the end, what it shows that in people who respond to secukinumab, because this study eliminates all the people who didn't respond well to begin with, but in the patients who are doing well, you have great stability in response. What's more, and I think this is really critical, with secukinumab, and this is also true with, uh, with ixekizumab, once you get to sufficient levels of drug, it's a pathway with the IL-17s of no escape. And that is almost all the patients, 91% of patients get to a posi-90 if you get sufficient numbers of, sufficient blood levels of the drug. So this whole pathway is sort of a pathway where everyone responds if you get sufficient drug. I might add, getting 53.8 micrograms per milliliter of secukinumab is actually a lot of drug that it takes to get there. But now let's think about the anti-P19s. Now there are four anti-P19 IL-23s that have been developed. Um, interesting fact, when people were first trying to figure out if we could block interleukin-12 and improve psoriasis, there are two subunits of, of interleukin-12. Uh, there's uh, the P40 subunit uh, and the P20 subunit, about P, P15 subunit. And what we found that the only one that worked was the one that shared the epitope with anti-IL with IL-23. And so they tried to block IL-12 by eliminating the one that, the subunit that wasn't shared, but it was only the one that shared with IL-23. When we tried to isolate IL-23 and not block interleukin-12 with binding the P19 subunit of IL-23, uh, we actually demonstrated great, greater efficacy. And so that's why we've had this whole development of this new set of drugs that binds interleukin-23 alone. There's one kicker I'm going to bring out, and I want to, I'm going to challenge everyone to remember this. It turns out in the last year that we found another cytokine that actually has the P19 subunit. That cytokine trainees is? Oh, of course, you all know interleukin-39, right? I didn't know about interleukin-39. Um, but it's really interesting that that probably works by different pathways. And I'm going to show you some data in the, in coming up that really, dem I think, suggests that that's not irrelevant to what we're talking, not relevant to what we're talking about. So this is the Voyage 2 model, uh, Voyage 1 study, and looking at two years of Guselkumab, which was the first anti-P19, anti-IL-23 uh, molecule to get it approved. And you look at the efficacy outcomes in this trial, and this was, these were tried against adalibumab. I might add with guselkumab was the first phase two program ever to have a comparator trial um, in it, but in the phase three, it compared to adalibumab. And what you see, the dosing is week, four, is week zero, week four, and then every eight weeks thereafter. Why was it done that way instead of using the ustikinumab uh, scale and the ustikinumab schedule? It was because of the experience that we all have using ustikinumab where patients flare at the end of the dosing interval. 
And it was really subtle, but you could see that in the phase two trials. So it was given at a shorter interval at every eight weeks. Now the one thing that's tricky about that is if you look at the primary endpoint of the study at week 16, it's not a trough level of the drug. So the drug is given um, at, every, at uh, week 12 and week uh, 20 because of the schedule. So most of the trials you'll see in clinical trials, the end point of the study is at the trough level of drug. That's not the case with guselkumab, and I think it might be a subtle but potentially important distinction in the way we think about these clinical trials. But you see POSI 75 levels of 90%. POSI 90 levels of 73%, and POSI 100 approaching 50%. Now, I want to go back a few years. Most of you in the room don't remember this, but Steve Feldman put out a paper in, I think, 2001 or 2002 uh, when I was still young, and it showed that, and it was an argument that we should never even try to clear patients in psoriasis trials because it's a standard that we'll never get to. Here we're talking about up to 50% of patients getting clear in clinical trials of psoriasis. And if anyone would have an argument that that's important, we could talk about quality of life. But I think in terms of dermatology and where dermatology fits, I think in almost any other disease, I think hepatitis C has us beat because they actually cure the disease. But I think we've made more advances in the treatment of psoriasis in the last 20 years than almost any other disease in medicine. And I think it's something that is really kind of spectacular. So you see these great results, and they persist over time. Here's where we're going out to two years, uh, where you're seeing at two years the numbers persist. Now, I'm not going to go into the imputation, but one thing that I want you to look at when looking at clinical trials going forward, especially in long-term trials where people fall out for lots of reasons, the studies aren't as, um, effect aren't as effective over longer periods of time. Look at the number of patients who stay in the trial over time. And if you look at this trial, um, looking at the number of patients, in two years you go from an N of 329, and that's from day zero, to 290 at two years out. In other words, you've lost a little over 10% of the patients in two years. That's actually remarkable maintenance of patients in trial. And what does that mean? That means these patients are very happy to stay in the trial. Now, there's another biologic that blocks the same mechanism that just was approved, and that's tildrakizumab. Tildrakizumab has been in two phase three trials as well, the resurface one and two trial. And tildrakizumab has been approved by the FDA. It is not yet available for a number of reasons, not the least of which is this drug was developed by Merck. Merck then sold it to Sun, um, and they're still in the process of transferring all the rights to the drug to the other company. So it's just a short period of time before we're actually going to have access to the drug. With uh, tildrakizumab, you see the outcomes that are not quite as high as uh, guselkumab, but you begin to see high-level responses when you go out to 28 weeks. Now, I want to bring up another point. It was brought up today earlier, and I think it's important that we have perspective. Um, I want to go back to this for a second, and that is looking at the rapidity of response. We've had a lot of uh, talk about how fast responses happen in uh, the anti-IL-17s. And I had a wonderful conversation once in a, in a meeting with Mark Lebwall. And Mark got up and said, we need our patients to get better as fast as humanly possible because I have actors and I have politicians in my practice in New York City and these people need to get better yesterday. And I got up and I said, you know, Mark, I agree with you entirely and that's a big thing that I'm facing in Milwaukee all the time. If you look at the number of patients who get to a POSI 75 at week 8, you're at over 65% with guselkumab. When do you see patients who start, you start on biologic therapy for that second visit? I see them in about three months. Why? A, because they don't really have any words about safety. B, because, well, that's my next available appointment. And three, because... They get there fast. They're going to see things happen quickly. And so having something that at endpoint at week four or week eight really doesn't matter to me all that much. 
there are certain things that it's important. In drugs that we don't expect great responses, looking at early response I think is really critical. Things like methotrexate, things like a premolast, because if we could predict if patients are gonna get better, then you can say, okay, then we can change you earlier on, not let you suffer uh, with, the medic with the disease. But in, disease, in drugs that have very high responses, every patient knows they're getting better that's going to respond relatively early. And so that rapidity of response, those small differences are probably not that important. Um, here's the overall efficacy with uh, tildrakizumab out at two years. Again, high-level responses, probably not quite as good as gisalkimab. One drug that a lot of people are looking forward to is a drug that just was uh, filed with the FDA yesterday, um, or was it two days? It might have been in the last two days. And the data was just presented as a late breaker at the AAD um, a few weeks ago. So I'm just going to really go quickly with Rizinkizumab. The Rizinkizumab has gotten a lot of publicity about another point. Um, this is the Rizinkizumab trial. It's 150 milligrams, and it's given on the Ustikinumab uh, schedule of week zero, four, and then every 12 weeks thereafter. And here's the data with POSI uh, 90s up around 75%. And POSI 100s in the Ultima 2 trial reaching 50% in, 12, in uh, 16 weeks. Additionally, and this is something I want to point out that I think is very important, at the POSI 90 level, here's where you can see that breathing, that recurrence uh, of disease with ustikinumab at the end of the dosing interval, where you can see every four weeks you come up and here's the end of the dosing interval, you see the disease coming back. With rizinkizumab, that disappears. Therefore, one can see that the dosing interval of tw every 12 weeks with rizinkizumab is probably right, as opposed to the eight weeks that we see with um, uh, guselkimab, which was required to get that intact. In Before I get to some of the other differences I want to point out, I want to go back to Dr. Cooper's slide, where he had all the different uh, drugs and red lines going to different conditions that we worry about. And Kevin, I noticed that you didn't mention, but with the anti-P19, anti-IL-23s, there was no line. In other words, in the clinical trials with these drugs, we haven't found a reason not to use the drug. And I want to challenge everyone to think about when you see a patient in clinic. Everyone says, has anyone ever had a drug rep go, what kind of patient would you use this drug for? That response usually gets a whack on the head from me. But assuming I can't do that and not get, you know, thrown in jail at the moment, um, what's really the question you're asking yourself when you see a patient who you're going to start on a biologic? It's not, is this patient the ideal patient for this drug? No, it's thinking about what can't I use for this patient? That's the first thing that goes through your minds. So if the patient has a history of IBD, you'll say, I can't use an IL-17. If the patient has class three or four New York Heart Association heart failure or has a history of MS, you'll say, I can't use an anti-TNF. With the anti-IL-23s, as far as I know to date, I don't have that question that I can't use the drug for anything. Part of the reason we might not have a lot of information is because of the entry criteria for clinical trials. If you remember, when you look at clinical trials, the patients undergo entry criteria. So they're not the sickest population. In fact, we all know anti-TNFs have an infection risk. You can't show it in the clinical trials of psoriasis. So what we're going to have to see is over the long term what shows up with anti-IL-23s with registry studies but to date, we don't have any significant safety messages we can talk about. The other thing is what happens with these drugs over the long term. I think this is a really important question. So this is ixekizumab. Um, and you see, when you stop ixekizumab, and here's the placebo arm, you start losing drug uh, effect very quickly. With um, secukinumab, you have a small number of patients who can persistently have impact of the drug even after you stop the therapy. But we're talking at, at uh, 12 months of one in uh, 10 at most. So you have small numbers of patients. With the anti-IL-23s, that's distinct. So this is with Voyage 2, this is with Guselkimab, and this is maintaining a POSI-90 response. This isn't loss of half of the response um, that you have, which is how you typically look at recurrence of disease in clinical trials. 
This is loss of a posi 90, that very, very high level response. And then what you see is you meet the median. This is my drawing, so it's not perfect. But you meet the median about 44 weeks. That's actually 48 weeks from the last time they had a drug. So half the patients who reached a posi 90 haven't lost it yet in about three months. Think about that in terms of the maintenance of response. I'm going to go to this slide next. And with Rizinkizumab, that's where this analysis was really looked at. And this is from the phase two trial. The data from phase three has not been made public. But 225 days, and this is 12 weeks after starting at the last dose, loss of posi 90 hasn't even hit 50% yet. What does this mean? It means that though no one's going to want you to do this over time, there is the potential with these drugs to try to figure out how to use these drugs in an as-needed basis over time. I can't recommend that right now because those trials haven't been done, but they need to be done because you could potentially decrease greater exposure to medicine and decrease cost, which I think is centrally important in our uh, use of biologic medications. Now, I'm going to go back to this slide because I think it's really kind of key. Uh, we were talking before about uh, the IL-39 and whether there are other mechanisms at play here. This is looking at, in those patients who have recurrence of disease, what's going on. It turns out the patients who are having recurrence of disease, you get what happens is you start invoking this same IL-17 pathway. Recurrence is associated with reactivation of IL-17, and I think that's incredibly important to think about when we think mechanistically that these things are all related, but what we're probably doing is changing the regulatory mechanisms, not just the pro-inflammatory pathway. Are there any other clinical di distinctions to be made? Well, this is psoriatic arthritis. We just heard a great talk on psoriatic arthritis. I might add <clears throat> that the very first psoriatic arthritis psoriasis clinic was actually at Northwestern, um, but we won't go into that. Um, but um, obviously IL-17 and IL-23 are actually extremely important, and here's the data on ixekizumab that you've seen, um, and this is uh, joint progression, again, showing improvement. Um, and this is looking at enthesitis and dactylitis, all very well and got good. This is looking at the ACR responses with kuselkumab, with the first um, anti-IL-23 that we've seen, and the data looks fine. But I want to add that ustikumab in phase two looked pretty good in, in psoriatic arthritis as well and did not have that great a level of efficacy. So for the time being, until we have phase three trials and a greater understanding of anti-IL-23s in psoriatic arthritis, if I have to choose, I'm choosing an anti-IL-17 or an anti-TNF in patients with psoriatic arthritis and not so much the anti-IL-23s until I have greater information. Um, though, again, with enthesitis and dactylitis, you're seeing some improvement as well. So in conclusion, I'm going to end up on time. I'm very excited about that. It's just emerging. We've only had it for a number of months, going on about a year right now. It was, Guselkima was approved about a year ago now. Um, they're unique in their pharmacodynamic effects with long responses prior to recurrence of disease. And I think that's really critical to understand how that plays in the greater model of, psori of psoriasis. Safety in clinical trials is actually remarkably clean. But we need to understand this over time, not in just a clinical trials uh, population. Impact on psoriatic arthritis is not established. Um, there's lots of information. These drugs are being tried in uh, inflammatory bowel disease right now and other things. But we still need to know what goes on with comorbid disease, including psoriatic arthritis.